Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. You might not know today's guest yet, but you will soon because he is one of the esteemed speakers on the upcoming The Real Truth About Weight Loss Summit. He has written a wonderful book, which if you have children, it's super important to read. And even if you don't, the information is I think the same for adults, because I don't think sugar is good for anyone, but especially for children and other living things. The book is called Sugar Proof, and I have the hard copy because I got it a while back, but tomorrow it comes out on paperback with a brand new cover. So we'll put some links so that you can order either the hard copy or the paperback copy, or even the audible, which is what I got, because I like to listen and read at the same time. And we're here today to talk about sugar, but also a little bit about artificial sweeteners. Are they worse than sugar? We're going to find out. Please welcome Dr. Michael Gorin. It's so nice to see you again. Yes. Hi. Good to see you. Thank you so much for having me on again. Really yeah, appreciate no, it. I really, really admire your work. And I wish there was a Dr. Michael Gorin in 1960 when I was the fat kid writing a book like this or telling parents, hey, you know, sugar's not the greatest thing. Well, we've, we've, we've learned a lot since then. Um, I think the science has, has changed quite a bit. I just remember Kool-Aid. <laughs> I mean, I know my mom didn't know. I mean, I, I don't blame her, but I mean, I just, yeah, I wore a special t-shirt for you, Dr. Gorin. Uh, okay. <laughs> In case my viewers aren't familiar yet with your work, who are you and what do you do and where do you do it? Yeah, I'm a professor of pediatrics at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm not a People think I'm a pediatrician because I'm a professor of pediatric, but I'm not a pediatrician. I do research, clinical research in real people, nutrition research, all in children. And I've been doing that for over 35 years, trying to understand the effects of diet, food intake on kids' health. That's amazing. So is some of this research published? Could we read it someplace if we wanted to? Yeah, the, I mean, that's well, one of the purpose of the books was to kind of summarize a lot of the research related to sugar. And so that's one reason why I read, wrote, wrote the book, because I wanted to reach more people. Uh, so the book is a lot more uh, lively than, than reading the research papers. They can be kind of dull and very technical. But yeah, if you, if you Google or do a Google Scholar, you'll find all my papers, over 400 papers that we've published in the last 30 years. That's, that's quite impressive. And when you say you do research, do you actually bring the children into like a laboratory to study them? Yeah. Yeah. We have a facility. It used to be at USC up until three years ago. Then I moved it to Children's Hospital. So it's a, it's a clinical facility. We bring families in for testing. Uh, we do trials of kids on different diets and take, do surveys or do measurements of body fat or sometimes blood tests, even MRIs in some cases, depending on the nature of the study. So these are what we call patient-oriented research uh, that we do in, in human subjects. Have you found that in your 35 years of research, the children are getting bigger? Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, when I started to do this, Research, it really was not even on the radar that much. There was very few people doing research, research in this area. Uh, certainly uh, awareness of excess weight gain and obesity increased, but it wasn't until the year 2000 that we started talking about type 2 diabetes in children, which used to be called adult onset type 2 diabetes. Um, but that's increasing, and then now non-alcoholic fatty liver disease wasn't even a disease until 10 years ago. And that's now definitely a disease and definitely affecting children. And that's related also to sugar intake. So those are, you know, three very dramatic changes in, in, in the clinical environment that, that I've seen in my time in research. Yeah, because these aren't diseases of, I mean, these don't have to be diseases of anybody, but they certainly shouldn't be diseases for children. No, I mean, they're, they're, they're chronic diseases. Uh, and what we've learned is that, yes, prevalence is increasing in children, but it's still thankfully not that common. But the point is that the, 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 the subclinical risk is there for these chronic disease risks. It's not like you wake up at age 45 or 50 with type 2 diabetes or fatty liver disease. 
that that process is ongoing from birth, if not from before birth, and it's related to diet. That was so interesting when I read your book about how that the nutrition of the mother can even affect it, the, the child after he's born. That's right. We call that the developmental origins of disease. And we've learned a lot about that in the last 10 or 15 years about how the developmental environment, what the, the developing fetus is exposed to nutritionally uh, can affect its short and long-term health as a child and as an adult. And that, we're going to talk about that in the context of sugar and sweeteners as well. You, there's some surprising information there about sweetener consumption during pregnancy, how it affects the developing child. One of the things that it seems that the experts agree on, you know, whether a parent is going to feed a child sugar or not, ultimately, is that they're, they're feeding their children too much sugar too young. Would you agree that that's pretty accurate? Yeah, and I think that you know, studies have shown that, the data shows that, but it's not just more sugar, uh, but it's different types of sugar and in different forms. So we have a lot more reliance on uh, liquid sources of sugar. It used to be the main source of hydration for a child was water or milk. And now it's juices. That's a relatively new thing in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, so that's a generational shift in the type of sugar and the source of sugar. And, and it turns out that the liquid forms are much more problematic because they're more concentrated in sugars and they overwhelm the metabolic capacities uh, for, for appropriate metabolism. It's almost like a bolus, isn't it? It's a bolus, it's a bolus dose. It's like the analogy I used in the book, and this happens to me all the time, uh, with my sink disposal unit. If you, if, if you shove too much down at once, like if you're peeling carrots and potatoes and you shove it all down and you turn on your, your sink thing, um, it'll clog up, right? Because those things can only handle small amounts um, all at once. So if, so if you like put a little bit down, it'd be fine. But the bolus is really problematic and that's metabolic. There's there's rate limiting steps in what the body can metabolize. Um, and those can be overwhelmed, especially for a, for a young child where, where, where there's you know, more limitations. Yeah. Do you, are you, do you know what the history of sugar is in the world? I mean, I read sugar blues, but I'm sure at one point in human history, we weren't eating sugar except in its natural form fruit. Well, that's right. Yeah. There, there's, there's several books about the whole history and it's tied to um, slavery and to all the problems with, with fat. But, you know, if you go back 200 years, um, even during the colonial period, sugar consumption in this country was, was minimal. I think it was something we, we have the numbers in the book. I think it was like a bag of sugar a year or something like that um, for, for, for the average person. But now the average adult is consuming a two pound bag of sugar. Guess how many days it takes us? Five? five is, yeah, exactly right. So every five days we're eating through the equivalent of a two pound bag of sugar. Do I get a prize? <laughs> yeah, I'll send, you a, I'll send you a free copy of Sugar Proof. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, it, it's funny because I haven't eaten any sugar since Sunday, July 6, 2003. So I bet you somebody out there is eating my share. Well, that's the thing. These are averages. These are average numbers. So um, you, you, there's there's people who are eating uh, a two pound bag every three days or every four days. Well, and it's those extremes. And again, if you look at the research, it's the, it's the extreme levels that are the most uh, problematic. Well, do you think for some people it can be addictive? Oh, well, for sure, yeah. Um, there's always a little bit of hesit hesitancy in using the, the, the addictive word, the A word, but I like to kind of look at the definition of addiction. And if you look at the clinical definition, the clinical criteria for addiction, sugar consumption meets almost all of those clinical criteria for addiction. Yeah. It's hard to give up. If you do try to give it up, it can be painful. You crave it more. 
uh, and those kinds of things. Those, those are all criteria for addiction. But when people finally do give it up, they can find they can have a pretty sweet life without it. Yeah, for sure. And that's the case. And um, that, that, you know, that wall that you hit, if you do try to give up sugar, even if it's with a young child, it's only a day or two. And we, we've worked now with hundreds of families all over the country, in fact, all over the world. Because in the book, we have a, it's called a seven day no added sugar challenge. And it's basically a blow by blow, day by day strategy for how to get your family through that. Not to give up sugars, but just to see what it's like without sugars. And from there, many families start on a downward tra trajectory. Uh, but in the book, we give the, the very detailed plans because you can't just show up on Sunday afternoon and say, that's it, people, there's no more, no more sugar. And, you know, that strategy, again, is informative. We're, we're not trying to say you can never give your kid sugar ever again. Some families may want to do that, but for many families, that's really not a tenable solution or it's not a sustainable solution. Yeah. Well, I think if, if you don't, if you're not raised with it, you don't really know. Just like I, I was raised without salt and it's like salt's not a big deal to me. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You can certainly change that addiction, that craving. After the seven day new added sugar challenge, what we found is that kids are and adults are definitely craving less sugar. And it's basically like a big reboot. It's like a big reset. It's like a control alt delete where you can really reset those sweet taste preferences. The sweet taste preference is very powerful and very can, can overwhelm craving of other food. And uh, you can reset that just after uh, a short, uh, after seven days. Well, what about these, you know, the artificial sweeteners, or some of them may not be artificial, but they're zero calorie or low calorie sweeteners. A lot of people I work with are trying to manage their food addiction and lose weight and, and decrease their cravings. And so they'll turn to things like erythritol or mannitol, you know, any of the sugar alcohols or maybe stevia, not usually the green leaf, but the liquid uh, dropper bottle or powder, or maybe aspartame. Uh, are these healthier for us? Will they help us lose weight? No, not necessarily. In fact, the, the research shows the opposite. Uh, the, the only, the research on this is pretty clear. The only clinical situation which uh, diet sodas, which have been the ones that have been studied most, even though these sweeteners are becoming completely prevalent in our food supply. Uh, for adults who are trying to lose weight, there's one study that shows that with the provision of diet sodas to those individuals, they will be more successful in, in weight loss, more so than if they're just given water. That's just one study and one condition. Most of the other studies actually show the opposite of what you would expect, more weight gain uh, with uh, use of these, these products. And I've not only seen people have more difficulty losing weight when they include them, but it, it's for me, it's like the, the constant craving. That's what I love about, about a sugar-free life is I, when, when you don't have an addictive substance, you don't crave it. And the people I know that use these, whatever you want to call them, sugar analogs, it, it, they don't ever seem to reset their taste for sweet. If, in fact, it gets worse, I find sometimes. Yeah. And that's what the research is beginning to show. Um, and there's pretty good studies on this from a variety of different perspectives, from you know, population-based studies to functional MRI studies that show exactly what you're saying, uh, which ultimately is that these uh, sugar alternatives, sugar analogs, I like that. I really like that term. These analogs don't resolve craving for sweet food or it might not even resolve craving for calories in general. So you end up eating more for a variety of different reasons. Yeah, well, feel free to use the term sugar analog. And is, isn't it, it, doesn't it go something like this, that when our tongue, which has taste buds for sweet, taste sweet, our brain thinks, oh, good, calories are coming, but the calories never come. So don't they still pump out the insulin and make us hungry? Yeah, exactly. That's right. So as soon as, so, so these compounds, these analogs, 
are all very powerful activators of the sweet taste receptors. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands in some cases, times more powerful than sugar. And we have, by the way, we also have these receptors, not just on the tongue, but also in different parts of the body, like in the gut and in, in the liver. And when those, when those receptors are activated, it initiates a cascade of events that you can't, you can't stop. I mean, you can swirl around diet soda and spit it out, but it's too late because you've already activated those, those receptors. And those receptors are saying calories are coming, sugar is coming, uh, but they never come. So if the body thinks that sugars are coming, it's going to take sugar out of the blood and use it for energy. That's the response. But if it takes sugar out of the blood and it's not coming in, what's going to happen? Sugar crash, hypoglycemic. And yeah. when you're hypoglycemic, what happens? You get hungry, you get cranky. If you're a kid, you roll around the floors, uh, you know, demanding more food or, or whatever. And that hypoglycemia is what drives the greater food intake. So that's why there's a, and that's why there's a relationship between more food intake, not less food intake with uh, consumption of these sweeteners. And I find that if people are really honest, they don't taste very good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I say that a lot because I, you know, I, I don't like the taste of them. I don't like the taste of any of them and I've tried all of them. Um, and I think that's the case for many people too. I, I mean, we've, we've worked with some kids, some kids say they don't mind the taste. Um, but I just, I think that they taste different. And I think that's another issue is that they're not training our bodies to like natural flavors because they, they don't taste natural. Even though things like stevia are natural or monk fruit, we're talking about a purified product. We're not eating monk fruit. We're not eating stevia. We're eating purified products that have a different taste and a different aftertaste. And so our strategy is really to say, well, why, why contaminate the taste? It's not, why compromise on that? If we're going to make food or eat food, it should probably taste good, right? We would hope, yeah. <laughs> so so what, what, was the, what was the thinking behind them? You know, I remember I was born in 1960 and my grandmother was already type two diabetic. And I remember in her purse, she had this really beautiful, like a pillbox and like there would be these little, like it would be like, it was saccharin back then. Yeah. And I guess that was suitable for her for she was diabetic, but it, it tasted terrible. And then didn't it get pulled by the FDA at some point? Saccharin got pulled for a while and then it got reintroduced. Yeah, there was there was some data that's still very controversial as to whether it causes or contributes to risk of cancer. Um, but I mean, FDA is pulling foods or putting grass approval generally recognized as safe, you know, based on... You know, lethal studies in rats. So it's all based on ultimate toxicity or causing death or causing cancer. And these, these decisions by the FDA are not based on long-term uh, effects or certainly not based on subclinical effects like alters your gut microbiome or makes you more hungry or makes you eat more. The, 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 the safety levels are all based on, is it gonna kill a rat in a lab? And that that's I mean I don't want to eat something that's generally regarded as safe. You know what yeah. I mean? Generally, generally say I mean that doesn't that's not a great selling point for me. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's that's... generally safe. You know, I wouldn't want to feed my kid or my my dog something that was generally regarded as safe. Are other countries as permissive in their use of these products as the United States? Yeah, they vary a little bit. Some countries have different. Uh... Different sweeteners are approved. Some aren't approving things that are approved here. So they, they vary a little bit by country, but they're still uh, pretty broadly used uh, globally, I would say. Do, what, what is the incentive from food manufacturers for us to use those as opposed to just regular sugar? Are they more expensive? You know, a lot of times they, I've seen products where they combine real sugar with artificial ones in the same product. Yeah, I th I mean, what concerns me also is that this is the, the food 
manufacturers' response to consumer demand for reducing sugar and even demand from policy and government to reduce sugar is to say, okay, well, we'll take some sugar out, we'll just replace it with some, some other sweetener. So they're able to um, respond to consumer demands or to policy demands uh, using those swaps. But I think it's gonna backfire in the end, personally. And I, I'd much rather see other formulations being worked out that just use less sugar yeah, you know, I'm not an expert on the microbiome, but I interviewed several, several, probably over 30 now for a summit at GI doctors, and they say that the artificial ones are worse for our gut, for our microbiome, that it's better to eat sugar if you're going to have sweet. Better to eat sugar and just eat less of it. Right. Yeah, and the, 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 the reason is nothing's for free, right? The, these come calorie free, they're designed to be calorie free. Um, the reason they're calorie free is they're not absorbed. It's not like the calories just disappear. They're just not absorbed. Um, so if they're not absorbed, they just hang around in the gut. And if something hangs around in the gut, they just get chewed up by your microbes in your gut. And that those, those, the metabolism in the gut by the bacteria could produce or do produce compounds that affect your body and can alter the composition of that gut microbiome. And then that altered composition can cause health problems. Wow. Here's a question from a live viewer named Jean. And she says, sucralose is banned in Canada. Are there any artificial sweeteners banned in the United States? Yeah, uh, hygiene. Thanks for that question. Yeah, so like I said, there's different uh, different examples. So saccharin, like we mentioned, was banned for a while, but now it's uh, available. And I don't know of any others. We do talk a little bit about that in the book, so I'd have to go and check on that. But um, some, like allulose is a newer one, for example, that's rare sugar, which I think is now grass approved, generally recognized as safe in this country, but I'm not so sure it's approved in other countries, or it could be vice versa. Different countries have different uh, strategies. Mm -hmm. The, um, it, it was, it, which one of the artificial sweeteners was discovered after an oil spill? I don't know. Actually, it's, I, I don't know that. I, there's all kinds of interesting stories about other sweeteners, but I don't know the one about the oil spill. Um, two of the sweeteners were um, discovered accidentally by chemists who were trying to make different compounds in the lab, nothing to do with sugar. They were trying to make drugs or some other compounds and somebody licked their finger by mistake and it was very sweet. <laughs> and that's how one was discovered. And the very first one was discovered by the Romans because they used to boil grape juice in uh, lead pots and uh, produced uh, at the end of the day, if they boiled it all down, they discovered it was very sweet and that was lead acetate, which is now used to treat baldness and is not approved as a sweetener per se. But I'd be very curious to hear about the oil spill. Maybe I don't making, know that story. You know what, maybe I'm making this up. I'm Googling it now. I might've misspoke, yeah. but I'm going to, I, I, maybe it was a laboratory spillage. Hold on, the, the, let me. It was probably a laboratory spill, but yeah. yeah. I don't know why that came into my head, but yeah, that is so interesting. Um, the, a lot of people get GI distress though, even just, just from these, don't they? I mean, they may not know that they have it, but, but, but they do. And when they stop them, they, their gut feels better. Yeah, it could be subtle or it could be quite acute and it could vary. I myself, I'm very um, sensitive to sugar alcohols, for example, like as xylitol, malitol, erythritol, which people say is not as bad, but um, I'll get bloating. And that bloating is, it's gas. Where does that gas come from? It's hydrogen gas produced by bacteria in your gut that break the sugar alcohols down. And that's how they test for malabsorption. They, they give you a dose of, of the sugar alcohols and then you breathe into a bag and they're measuring your hydrogen gas. So 
that is a very clear cut example of GI, very acute um, uh, distension and bloating after sugar alcohols, but the same can happen after other uh, sweeteners because of that uh, fermentation that's happening in the gut. I find that people that drink like the diet sodas drink way more of them than even people that drink regular soda, like that there seems to be something even more addictive about it. I mean, I know people that drink like 12 diet Cokes a day. Yeah, well, it's calorie free and sugar free. So it's, um, you know, it seems like a good deal. And that's the that's the danger, you know, that that's an obvious example. But the same thing could be happening if you have a packet of sugar free cookies, for example maybe you'll eat three or four instead of one or two. And so that's, it, that's, that's why the data show that there's more calorie intake and more sugar intake in people who habitually consume sweeteners. It just seems that people that drink the diet soda just can't stop. Yeah, yeah. And I, th- I think that, you know, the good thing is there's some really good products being introduced now into the market that are... There's still fizzy drinks. That seems to be a thing that that um, consumers are looking for, the fizzy aspect, the bubbles. And there's some great products now uh, on the market. Or you can make your own. I mean, these new products tend to be a little expensive, whereas diet soda is so cheap. It's another thing. Uh, but you can, you know, you can make your own with just squeeze a little bit of orange juice or lime juice or lemon juice into fizzy water. Voila, you have your own homemade concoction. You know, what I do is I put a tablespoon of a high quality balsamic vinegar in a fruity flavor. And then I have a soda that instead of having 140 calories has 30 calories and yeah. only seven grams of sugar from the grapes, as opposed to 38 from, which isn't even sugar anymore because now soda is sweetened with high fructose corn syrup, which as I learned from your book is worse. Yeah, that's another story for sure. Yeah, and um, that happened in the seventies. That was, you know, that that was a response by the food industry. That was an economic thing for the food suppliers because uh, high fructose corn syrup. It's made from corn. It's just basically a conversion of corn to corn syrup. Uh, corn syrup is all glucose, and then you can convert some of that glucose into fructose. Uh, and pr- producing high fructose corn syrup, which turns out that process is cheaper than extracting sucrose out of, uh, out, of, out of cane. Are there ever products out there that we could accidentally be consuming these, what I consider toxins or poisons without knowing it, like where they don't have to disclose it? happens to me regularly because I'm always on the lookout for new products and something like pops out of me at the grocery store. Uh, Oh, that looks good. Um, Oftentimes I'll spot it, but it's, you got to look very closely at not at the front of the label. You got to look at the ingredients and know what they know, what the names are to look for. Uh, So it can be a little tricky. I've still kind of made some, made, you know, made some errors and brought stuff home and tried them. And the taste is usually what gives it away from me because it tastes kind of weird. Uh, but now, you know, there's also these other products like Neotame is a sweetener that is, I think, 20,000 times sweeter than sugar. I think we calculated for, for fun that if you put a, I can't remember if it was a teaspoon or a tablespoon, of neotame and a bath of water, it would that bath of water would taste just as sweet as Coca Cola. I heard of something that people paint on their tongue and everything tastes sweet. Did, did, have you heard about that? I saw this product. Uh, there, there's new. I don't know about that product. There's new products. There's a lot of new products like that coming out that are that are working to kind of alter how how the body perceives. Um, taste. But the story in the neotame, it comes back to your question because it's so sweet that so little of it is needed to be added to a food. And it's so little that it's under the threshold of what needs to be disclosed in a food label. 
So it could be it could be uh, labeled as um, flavor, flavoring, and no, I don't, a, I don't which could be anything. Them. I don't trust those natural flavors. I just don't because I find that something happens to my brain when I eat them. Like, like I like to eat food and enjoy it and think to myself, this is good. But when I start thinking this is really good, I know they've done something to it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's how I know. I just saw a question um, from Jesse. And then also Sue has the same question. Uh, what about xylitol? It was recommended by my dentist. Anything in OL, I'd stay away from. Yeah, OL at the end means it's a sugar alcohol. And, I mean, xylitol is recommended by, by the dental uh, organizations uh, because, uh, be, because gut bacteria can't can't thrive on it the way that it can thrive off of regular sugar. And, and also it has some uh, other favorable um, properties on the teeth, but the problem is once it gets past the teeth, it actually gets swallowed, you know, once, once you swallow the xylitol um, from the gum that you're chewing or whatever, um, it has to go somewhere or in that somewhere is broken down by the gut bacteria. So, Unless you have a major issue, I wouldn't, you know, again, I'd stay away from, from that. Hey, um, we're here today, if you tuned in late, talking with Dr. Michael Gorin, the author of Sugar Proof, which comes out in paperback tomorrow. Dr. Gorin, will you show your paperback copy? Because yeah, it has a different cover. I was just about to show that. Yeah, thanks. So it, it's a different cover. We redesigned the cover. Um, i trying to remember why we did that. We want, we, I think the publisher and us as well wanted a bit more of an upbeat message. So the, uh, the, 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 sub, the subtitle is positive, protect your family from the hidden dangers of excess sugar with simple everyday fixes. And the, uh, the idea here was that we should be eating fruit, not drinking fruit. So we have you know, three glasses full of chopped fruit. That's okay, we would say that's fine. Eat that fruit, don't drink it. Uh, it's the drinking the fruit that is problematic because it tends to be much more concentrated and much more rapidly absorbed. Yeah, absolutely. A, a live viewer named Nathi says, bought his book, great interview, AJ, thank you. You know, I was at the store today buying vegetables and fruit and they had these juice drinks for children, which of course stores carry, but what I noticed they did, and it caught my eye and I almost bought it, not to drink it, but because I'm a big fan of Scooby-Doo and one of them was Scooby-Doo is instead of like tops, like it was a straw with characters like Scooby-Doo and Powerpuff Girl. And it's like, I mean, if I would, I could barely resist it as in a, as a 62 year old. Could you imagine if I was a kid? Yeah, I haven't seen those products. Um... And that's yeah. The the, the 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 food industry is using these kind of tactics to latch kids on. Um, I wish they would get the message that um, juices are really problematic. There are some companies that are making lower concentrated juice, like the Honest juices, um, are kind of almost just diluted, which is what we would say to do at home. Is just to dilute the juice, at least as a strategy to begin with. Um, but yeah, that's, un that's unfortunate. Um, and th th those tactics are directly marketing to uh, people like you or to kids. Yeah, I'm a big kid. You know, it's funny, I had to take a minute. Yeah, same as with uh, breakfast cereal. You know, I'm always like walking down the grocery store and grabbing grocery boxes because they're shouting out at me. They're brightly color colored with animated characters. And I, I picked them up just because I'm curious to see what food companies are up to to market their product. You know, I agree with you about juice. I mean, I, I drink vegetable juice sometimes, but fruit juice is, I mean, it's, it's actually sweeter than, than soda. And it's funny because the other day I had, I, I have TMJ. So the doctor just ordered a, a, a six day of steroid pack just to kind of knock the inflammation down. And whenever I take a medication the first time, I take it with food just until I know what effect it's going to have. But I, I'm not really a morning eater. And I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? It's seven o'clock. I'm not hungry. So I took a little bit of applesauce, you know, just applesauce made from apples. 
and I could barely eat it. It was sickly sweet to me, you know? And uh, I mean, and this is somebody that used to drink Coke Slurpees for breakfast. So I want to give people hope that, you, you know, I was a sugar addict for 43 years. And now when I eat strawberries, I'm like, who put the sugar in them? Like fruit is too sweet sometimes for me. So there is hope. And there's a question from a live viewer. And it is how long would you have to be off artificial sweeteners before you notice an improvement? Um, I don't know for sure. I don't know that those exact studies have been done, but I would say it would be fair. Well, I didn't get into this. I mean, so there's these acute effects on the gut. Those you would probably um, get a pretty rapid response once once you um, get off that, maybe you know, take a probiotic as well to try and get your gut microbiome back on track. I would think that'd be pretty quick, uh, but there are, you know, longer term effects we just don't know i mean it's like it's like anything like i live in la which is very polluted and there's air pollution that causes brain damage and i'm always asking the same question like if i just go breathe some healthy air for a few days will i fix my brain damage that i might have gotten i, I don't know uh, but i don't think we know we will never know but there's only one way to to find out and that's to um to make the switch i think you'll get you'll get benefits. How many days, how many weeks, I don't know, but we know that it's better for you not to be consuming those products. Mm. Um, Lorraine maybe is tuned in late. She says, what about monk fruit? I mean, just because something is natural doesn't mean it's good for you because I mean, you know, cocaine is fairly natural. I mean, it's from a cocoa leaf. Yeah, I find this argument uh, problematic too because sugar itself is natural. Sugar is, sugar is purified from sugar cane. Monk fruit is purified from a, a fruit that grows in Asia. Um, so it's a purified product. Uh, by itself, has a very, very bad taste. And so it goes through some processing to try and remove that flavoring. Um, so that really doesn't help me that's because natural products can still affect the body in different ways. And that's what we have to uh, have to keep in mind. So it's it maybe better than something like ACE K or uh, sucralose, which are uh, synthesized chemicals, but they still have effects on the body that may be quite similar. Right, I just wanna thank. Devin for her super chat donation. Thank you so much. Here's a fun question from a live viewer named Jean. Why are you so interested in this topic? What got you interested in it? Yeah, thanks. Is this the same Jean? Thank you. I, 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 yeah, I think so. <laughs> we, have, we have a great audience that watches. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I love that question. question. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, I, so I mentioned I've been doing this research for over 35 years and I would say in the last 10, 15 years, we started to focus on, on sugar because it was driven by the results. We started to see a pattern uh, from the research. I always say like I follow the yellow brick road. My yellow brick road is data that comes from our studies. Um, and those data kept, we weren't even looking. First of all, we weren't looking at diet. And then once we started looking at diet, we weren't specifically looking at sugar. It's just that sugar kept, coming out of those analyses as something that was problematic and something that was quite modifiable. And so over the last 10 or 15 years, it was a very interesting, compelling story that came together that had to be told because the honest truth is all those 400 research papers, no, you know, very few people actually read them, but the, well, what I decided was the research was so important for the public that I wanted to accelerate that knowledge transfer because oftentimes research takes 10 years to get to the public. So I decided to accelerate that process by writing a book and getting on a mission to help uh, families, consumers everywhere understand better how sugars and sweeteners are affecting them and their kids. Yeah, uh, well, more and more doctors are joining this team. So thank you. Uh, Elizabeth says dates, question mark. We both love dates, don't we? I do. Yeah, I, I do. I think so. And I, I get a little bit of pushback from this, but 
um, because people say, oh, dates is just sugar at the end of the day. But the thing is what we found, and we have several recipes in Sugar Proof that use dates as a, as a sweetener. And our strategy in Sugar Proof is not to use any added sugar and not to use any added sweetener. But dates is a whole food or a banana is a whole food or a grated apple is a whole food. So we like to use those types of uh, products just like Chef AJ has done for decades um, in foods as a sweetener. And there's a lot of benefits of that. First of all, it's a, it's a natural taste. So you get the natural taste of the whole food. Second of all, at the end of the day, it's a lot less sugar. And third of all, you get the other phytonutrients that are in the date or the banana or the apple that show up in the food. So there's a lot of different benefits of doing it that way. And then date syrup is probably okay. Date syrup is like maple syrup or honey, small amount of moderation is fine. And date sugar is also, it's hard to work with. Have, have you ever worked with date sugar? Yeah, I, I it's, don't it's love tough it, to work with. Right, because it doesn't dissolve. So it's, date it's sugar kind of, would be yeah. good if you're sprinkling it on something like oatmeal, yeah. for example. But, uh, but no, it doesn't dissolve because date sugar is really just dates that have been ground up. Yeah, it's just desiccated, dried up dates that are ground up. Right. So it just kind of congeals if you try to bake with it or something. But yes. yeah, that's a good good idea. Just like as a sprinkle, it's probably okay. Yeah, I, I prefer if I'm going to bake to use a date uh, date paste, or, which I make myself, or date syrup, which I used to make myself. But now that there's a wonderful company, Organics are for everyone. Uh, it's from Date Lady. I it's just I buy, but I try not to use too much of it. You know, yeah. like I said, I'd rather use banana as the sweetener, apples whenever possible. You know what my favorite, and I've never seen this here in this country. I grew up in Glasgow in Scotland. And uh, my favorite sandwich that my mom used to make me for lunch was a, was a, was a date paste sandwich. That sounds good. Just on, on any special kind of bread. Was there anything else? I on don't it? remember. The, I don't remember the bread or anything else on it. I just remember like a very, in, Hey, in Scotland, we have very simple sandwiches. I don't know if you've noticed, but sandwiches are just something in between bread. It's <laughs> <laughs> here in this country i discovered that a sandwich could be you know whatever you can like like a, get between bread that you can get in your mouth like a dad so I, I just remember the date paste and i loved that as a sandwich that's neat well somebody i'm glad you said where you were from because uh we had a question do i detect an accent yes a little bit yes i'd love yes scotland anybody out there from scotland or glasgow hello <laughs> How are you doing? Um, that's funny. Uh, Cindy says, please ask about the effect of sweeteners on the insulin release from the pancreas, which prompts fat storage. I understand stevia is horrible for the microbiome, but what does the science say, re the pancreas? I thought Dr. Ifland said it wasn't good for the pancreas, even the stevia, but what do you know about that and fat storage and things like that? Yeah, great question. And you know, I think there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. We, we, we have some studies underway to look at that very specifically um, because we don't really know what the short or long-term effects are. Uh, in fact, there is some evidence, there are some papers showing that stevia may have some protective effects on the pancreas, but that's still um, preliminary. So again, it may turn out to be uh, protective. I don't know. Uh, but in terms of uh, insulin response, um, stevia, I don't think there's evidence to show that it does release insulin. Um, but again, it might cause a hypoglycemic response and, um, and craving of food. The problem is, you know, there's just not, it's hard to study these single sweeteners by themselves. In, in the food supply, they're, as, as we mentioned, they're, they're used in different combinations in different places. So it's really difficult to isolate uh, effects on single sweeteners. We, you know, we need, we, need, we need better studies and to do those studies, you could just imagine, we'd have to give uh, stevia in controlled amounts to volunteer subjects for X amount of weeks and measure these things. So it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. 
It's funny, you know, I've worked with people for a while now, and I noticed they're always arguing for their form of sweetener as the healthiest or the best when many of the doctors I work with say the best is none or fruit, like you say, you know? Yeah, <clears throat> whole, whole, whole fruit um, would be good. Uh, you know, we, we, in our kitchen, we use a little bit of honey is fine or a little bit of maple syrup is fine. I think try to use less is better than using an alternative sweetener. I think it would be, if I was going to bake cookies or a cake this weekend or this week, I would much rather, instead of using a cup of sugar, my choices would be, okay, here's three choices. A cup of sugar, half a cup of sugar, or monk fruit or stevia. What, should, what would you choose? Well, you're going to, what I would choose is just use fruit. I would make, yeah. but you're going to choose the half a cup of sugar of those three choices. Is, is the Of those sugar. three chooses. Yeah. I mean, and in sugar proof, we've challenged ourselves not to use any sugar. That doesn't mean to say I never use sugar. Uh, I would, if I am, I would just use less of it. Right. And you can easily, I don't know if you've tried this, but you can easily cut it in half without it affecting the quality yeah, or the consistency. Absolutely. And I was a pastry chef, so I can tell you, you speak the truth. So I think what, what we found with that approach is because sugar is so powerfully um, activating the sweet taste receptors, if you use less of it, you're more likely to taste all the other great things in there. So like, for example, our, our sugar proof blueberry muffin, that's our most popular item it's got no sugar in it guess what you can taste the blueberries right uh, kathy says what's your opinion of coconut sugar yeah i like coconut sugar we have it in our pantry downstairs in the kitchen so it would be you know at the end of the day as far as the body is concerned it, yeah it's still sugar but it's got a couple of properties i like um it does have a little bit of fiber in it it does have a slightly better taste profile and the coconut is a more sustainable crop than sugar cane. So yep. I would, I would, you know, I, I, I favor it. It's more expensive, so that can be a problem, but maybe I'll, if, if I'm going to use that half a cup of sugar, maybe I'll use a quarter cup regular sugar and a quarter cup coconut sugar or all coconut sugar just depends. So I think it would be probably my number one top choice for a, a processed sugar in a bag because it's less processed. Well, maybe the best sugar is the one that the person will have the least of. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very personal too. Whatever you find works for you and your family to, to try and um, use less sugar. Yeah, I saw a question and I can't find it. I was the same person that asked, do I detect an accent? If uh, sugar was a big part of your upbringing. Yeah, I write about it a little bit in the book. Um, so I was brought up, I was, you know, Glasgow in the 60s, early 70s. Um, and I, I talk about the lemonade van. So in, 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 the, in Scotland or in the UK, soda pop is lemonade. So it's not like here where it's lemon juice with sugar. Lemonade could be any fizzy drink. So we had a, we had a lemonade van used to come around the neighborhood once, once a week or every other week. Uh, and we, you know, once in a while, yeah, my mom would buy as a bottle and we'd have it as a treat. So it just wasn't such an everyday staple, but, you know, my mom also loved to cook and loved to bake. So I definitely still have that love of baked cookies or baked cakes, um, but it was more of a treat than an everyday thing. Yeah. But I think that's the problem is people aren't doing what Michael Pollan says, which is to treat treats as treats. People are literally starting their day with dessert. That's right. Yeah. So do we have anybody from Scotland out there listening in? I don't think so. Somebody has cousin. Uh, Karen says she's not from Scotland, but her family is from Alloway, Scotland. So. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Did, you know, I know you prepared some slides, but I got so busy talking to you. Did you did you want to share them? I mean, you don't have to because you can always come back because I love talking to you because you're a fellow. I mean, you're I don't know if you're an anti sugar advocate as much as like Dr. Lustig and me, but you're a pretty powerful reduce sugar advocate, I would say. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it was more, I just, I think we kind of settled on a kind of a pragmatic approach because I'm more, I, I'm kind of a pragmatist at heart um, that I like to talk about what's practical. And, you know, for many families giving up sugar, for kids giving up sugar altogether, it's just, it, it could backfire. And I don't know if it's sustainable. And, and I think the research shows that the, that the issues, the problems are really in the extreme. So the, the goal is just to kind of move people downwards, you know, wherever you are on that spectrum, unless you're you where you can't go downwards, can't go into negative territory. But, you know, for most people, for a lot of people, uh, you, we can reduce sugar and you'll get benefits from that reduction. If you can keep reducing it gradually over time, that's also good. I think the problem is that whether or not a person, uh, okay, like, I guess I'll use the analogy that Dr. Goldhammer gives. There are people that can drink alcohol and not become an alcoholic, but if you're an alcohol, it's not you. And the, and so the recommendation is not to have any. And I find with sugar being an addictive substance, people vary in their vulnerability to that. And they have to know themselves because there are people like you that can probably have some, and there are people like me, like, you know, one drink, one drunk. I mean, I have something with sugar and I can't stop. So I think it's important that people know where they fall on that spectrum. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. That's a very, very good point um, to make. And um, I think it's very valid. Yeah, so, yeah, well, anyway, it's no, but I really appreciate, I appreciate your work. I appreciate the book. I appreciate the wonderful summit interview that's coming up Thank next you. month. Yeah. And uh, good luck. I, I, yeah, I, I love the new cover. It's so colorful. Okay, I did, I did um, have a say in the design of this new cover, so I'm quite proud of it. Um, it's although very eye-catching. I already had one um, person write to me and say, does that, are you trying to say that I shouldn't eat fruit? So we get that question a lot. So it's, this is not to say you shouldn't eat fruit. It's like eat fruit, don't drink fruit is kind of the message. Well, I get it. I get it. Well, mm. that's wonderful. Well, I hope uh, that uh, somebody said that they are uh, waiting for it in their library. They ordered it in the library. So if you can't wait, why not order it right now? Because tomorrow it will come out in paperback or enjoy the audible version as I did. Or Kindle. You can also get it on oh, Kindle. Kindle's great. Well, if you get the Kindle, they have it right now. Yeah. If you do get the audio book, uh, it should come with a PDF with all the recipes. It does, because I bought it on Audible and it does. You just have to you just have to read what it says and then you download it. Yeah, so, some people have said they didn't get it. And but if, if you if you don't have it, just you know, let me know and uh, we can get that to you. Do you think you might write another book? I don't, I don't know. Um, I always thought that the hardest part of writing a book was writing the book, but. Um, no, it it's promoting hard. the book. That's the hard yeah. part. So I'm, on my, yeah. I'm on my fifth book. It's not the yeah. writing. The writing's a piece of kale compared to what you got to do to try to sell it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so right now I'm still kind of in the midst of that. I, you know, I think we're thinking about a recipe book. Maybe we're, we're, there's 39 recipes in the book, but if you look on our website, sugarproofkids.com, there's probably at least that much more. Emily, my co-author, loves to develop new recipes. We just started today, actually, we launched our three ingredient banana bars. Uh, very simple. Well, she's coming on. I don't know the exact yeah. date, but I, I think it might be March. I But but yes, your co-writer's coming on. I think she's going to make that recipe. Yeah. It's very simple. It's just it's on our Instagram and Facebook as of today. I, it's on our website, sugarproofkids.com. I did put the links to your Facebook, Instagram website in the show notes, which are right below this video. I'm so sorry I didn't meet you when I lived in LA because I taught cooking classes in my home and I, you know, I, I make the best date sweetened desserts in the whole world. I have a cookbook coming out with, I'm going to ask you to endorse it actually. But I have an ebook now, but this is going to be like a hundred. I'm, I'm shooting to try to get over 150. I'm at 140 now. Recipes made with fruit, the whole fruit, and nothing but the fruit. Cool. But does endorsing mean I get to taste them? Well, I, <laughs> if I could get to LA, or you endorsing means you write a little blurb and then you get a free book. You know, you know, kind of yeah. like uh, 
kind of like Nicole Lavina did to your book, you know? Yeah. yeah that's what I mean. But, uh, but if you ever, Hey, if, do you ever come to the desert? Once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you're, you, you're in, you're in, where are you exactly? I'm 21 miles east of Palm Springs in Indio. And I would be oh, happy nice. to uh, make you something, you know, where, uh, where I live is the date capital of the United States. We have date farms here that you can do yeah, yeah. in a date festival, but we also have something called the date shake, which is like exceedingly oh, yeah. well, sweet and it's quite we, delicious. We, we always stop off at that place. Uh, what's it called near uh, you? It, it, it's either Shields or Hadley's. I'm not sure. Hadley's, which. Hadley's, yeah. And, and and they used to make them only with milk and I'm allergic to milk, but now they make the non-dairy one. Finally, they got the memo in 2022. <laughs> they, they, they're delicious, but they could save themselves some dates. Again, this is, this is you know, it'll save you money because you don't, it doesn't, you don't need to put that many dates in their date shake. It doesn't have to be sickly sweet. You know, we have a question about agave and my understanding that that is one of the worst sweeteners because it's higher in fructose than even high fructose corn syrup and it's metabolized in the liver. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So agave, most agave is 90% fructose. And the reason people like it is because agave is so sweet. So fructose which is chemically, almost chemically identical to, to glucose is twice as sweet. So you don't need as much of it, but the fructose is not registered by the body as calories. It, and as you mentioned, it's taken up by the liver and turned into fat. So anything with high fructose in it, we have a problem with. Well, you know what my mentor and sometime boss, Dr. Alan Goldhammer says, if you like it, you probably shouldn't be having it. <laughs> well, that's not the case with the things that you're making. No, right? that's true. That's true. <laughs> but he even calls my stuff too indulgent, but that's okay. He's, 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 a, you know, what I was going to say, I don't know if you've ever tried Saigon cassia cinnamon, but I get it at this place called local spicery and it is the sweetest thing you've ever tasted. There's no sugar, but you would swear it has sugar in it. It's quite remarkable. What's it? Say it again. I'm going to send you a link. Saigon cassia cinnamon. And it's, okay. it's it uh, every, when I went into a shop and I tasted, I said, there's sugar in here. He goes, I swear there's not. It's like the most delicious cinnamon, like and it can reduce the need for you know, sweetener in your food, because if, if, you know, something like if I'm making, you know, cin cinnamon buns, my own healthy version, you know, and, and this cinnamon just mm, so good. Yeah. And cinnamon has a lot of other great benefits uh, to, to the body, including um, reducing sugar cravings and reducing sugar, uh, glucose response. So that's, that's an added plus. Yeah, cinnamon's great. Well, it's such a pleasure always talking to you. So please feel yeah, free. Yeah, any, anytime. anytime. Um, love to. I, I did have some slides, but you anticipated all of the content. Did, did you want to? Um, no, I, I think or it's. Wanna, or you want to come we'll back? It, we'll oh, we'll do it again say, another time. Um, yeah, come because, back another time, or if you want to pop in when Emily's on, if, if, if you want. I mean, if she doesn't mind, it can be like a mixture. You'd let me know. I'm happy okay. to see you your work. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you to all your listeners out there. And uh, yeah, go get sugar proof. Absolutely. Especially if you have kids. Or grandkids. Exactly. Take care. Dr. Thank you Bowen. so thank much. You. Be well, everybody. Take care. Yeah. And Bye. thank you all for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow as we continue with Lifestyle Medicine Week from the American